Hey listeners, this episode of Covert features descriptions of violence, torture, and PTSD. Listener discretion is advised. October 1959, Roosevelt Hospital. Marita Lorenz had been involved in a whirlwind romance with the revolutionary Fidel Castro. She then became pregnant with his child. But seven months into the pregnancy, something happened that changed the course of her life. I would have these crying jags where I would curl up into a ball and cry my eyes out and wanting the baby and throwing things, you know, and they would give me pills to calm me down. Marita woke up in a car with her baby gone. Now suffering from blood poisoning, she required immediate surgery. And beside her, in the American hospital the entire time, not her beloved Fidel or even any of his aides, but the FBI waiting to speak with her and maybe help her exact revenge. They would have to have her so convinced that Castro had absolutely betrayed her, that his sole aim was to invade the United States and overturn the U.S. government, that the lives of, of millions of American people, people were at stake. Welcome to Covert, a show about the shadowy world of international espionage and top-secret military operations. Uh, some people in the press call him a real-life James Bond, and he certainly was. Uh, he used over 30 different aliases in his career as a spy and, and as, as an assassin. I'm Jamie Rennell, and I'm going to take you inside history's greatest special operations missions to learn about the people who risked their lives to eliminate threats and protect innocent lives. If I went ahead and just slipped him something to go to sleep, I would, we would not have an invasion force growing in Guatemala. The United States was convinced that Castro was a threat, such a threat that he needed to be taken out. To do that, they needed to convince someone close to him that he was a danger to humanity, even by taking it to extreme measures. This is The Castro Assassin, Part 2. In the hospital room in New York, a recovering Marita Lorenz was starting to get the full picture of what had just happened to her. Kevin Shipp is a former CIA agent. Uh, it, it, uh, it is apparent that uh, she underwent a forced abortion uh, in Havana. Uh, and, and then the question would be, uh, was that done by uh, the Cuban government? Was that done by the U.S. government or the CIA? Marita herself believes she was induced into early labor. That means it was either a miscarriage or the baby was still alive somewhere. But whatever happened, someone was responsible. Personally, I don't think the CIA would have done that. Uh, it would be my opinion, perhaps, that Castro himself may have been behind that. He had several lovers, and it's very possible that Marita was not the only one. And if a child was born, it could have caused him uh, possibly some political ramifications. So that's just my opinion. I don't think, personally, based on what I know, that the CIA would have, would have stooped to that lower level. Uh, they did have some parameters of things that they could not, would not do. No. No, no, absolutely not, not him, no, he, he had no reason to do that. He has five other boys with five other girls, you know. Uh, no, it wasn't him. It was somebody who wanted to destabilize Fidel's personal situation. And those people, I can only come to the conclusion that were CIA-backed because of the article, which made Fidel look like a kidnapper, a murderer of a teenager, this, killing her baby, and all that made it... It was to make him look like, like a villain to the world. Whatever the case, the CIA were quick to use this as leverage against Castro. If Castro was behind this forced abortion, then that would be probably, could be probably the ultimate development tool to use uh, uh, with Marita, because that would be a classic betrayal, not just a classic betrayal by her romantic lover, but also the loss of her child caused by Castro. So that would have been the, d the development topic number one. The CIA needed to destabilize Marita's idea of who Castro was, and at the same time, use her other weaknesses against her. She was currently in the hospital, away from friends or family, and didn't have any money or resources of her own. 
It was the step in recruitment the CIA calls development. And in that step, uh, the agency would now know the vulnerabilities that Marita had after the assessment. And to develop her, they would be begin appealing to those vulnerabilities. For example, she was betrayed. Um, she was emotionally traumatized, probably by her departure from Cuba. She wound up in a U.S. hospital alone, probably had financial needs. And so they'd begin appealing to that, building a level of trust, helping her out, reaffirming her ego, uh, kind of her courage, what she'd been through, and develop her into feeling secure with, with uh, the uh, officers that were handling her at the time and befriended and, and, and uh, build some trust and then basically win her over to uh, our side uh, using those particular types of techniques. First, the CIA agents tried to win her confidence by giving her home comforts. I, after the hospital stay, I was allowed to go home under 24-hour guard and recover physically and mentally and emotionally. Had the agents around me every day giving me so-called vitamins. They're going to try to convince her that the United States is the good guy and Fidel Castro is the bad guy, so that she had been betrayed by Fidel and, and developed in that, in that aspect and then recruited further. And they, they started this uh, program of, let's get even with him. He did this to you. Let's get even. About Fidel doing this, Fidel that, Fidel this. You didn't know that? No, you were too dumb, too blind, you know. They would curse at me. They would, they would keep me in the room. They wouldn't open the window. I wouldn't go out. They would just bring food. And, and I, I felt confined. And all they ever talked about, look, here's more proof. See, he's a commie. He's nothing but a damn commie. And you have to get, you have to do something. You're the only one that could do something. If you really wanted to clean this all up, be a hero, and, you know, appreciate your new country, get rid of the evil communism that's, that's infesting our country now, you can work for us. Now, I know a lot of my listeners are active or retired military, so I want you to listen up. Were you diagnosed with tinnitus or hearing loss after using 3M's dual-ended earplugs? These earplugs were yellow and black or yellow and olive, and they were often called Christmas lights. Instead of protecting your hearing, they actually permitted damaging sounds to get through. So if you were issued these earplugs while in service and then diagnosed with tinnitus or hearing loss, I want you to call 800-400-1349 because you may qualify for significant cash compensation. Again, if you were in the military and were issued 3M's dual-ended yellow and dark earplugs and were later diagnosed with hearing loss or tinnitus, then please call 800-400-1349 right now to see if you qualify for cash compensation. 3M knew about the defects, but they failed to warn anyone about them. So if you were in the military from any time between 2003 and 2015 and are now suffering from diagnosed hearing loss or tinnitus, please call 1-800-400-1349 right now. This lawsuit is against 3M and not the government or the military, so your benefits with the VA will not be affected. Here's the phone number one last time so you can get it. 1-800-400-139. Marita was unconvinced by most of their words, but the CIA was sure her resistance would give in sooner or later. She says they would give her drugs that made her groggy, and she often lost track of which agents were talking to her and what they were saying. So they kept me dreaming. All I had was a, a teddy bear and a little turtle to play with and no one else to talk to except them. I would have these crying jags where I would curl up into a ball and cry my eyes out and wanting the baby and throwing things, you know, and they would give me pills to calm me down. They said, that's, that's the anger coming out, and you have to do something to get rid of that anger. They repeated things over and over and over again. They relied on them totally for food, for food. They were always there. I had no one else. I had nowhere to go. Where was I going to go? 
I couldn't go to Cuba, not that, not run away. I couldn't go to Germany, Papa was at sea. My mother's working for the military. My brother was a, on a concert tour. He was a concert pianist, my youngest brother. And uh, Joe, the oldest one, worked in the UN. Aside from working on her personal relationship with Castro, the CIA also worked on her politically. Two of the FBI agents, Frank O'Brien and Frank Blanquette, interviewed her about her past to search for any political associations. Marita told them about her mother and father's involvement in World War II. My mother and father were in Tegucigalpa in the German embassy with all other high Nazi officials. And how that became about, I don't know, it just tells me that they were both spies. Both her parents ended up becoming double agents. With that story, the CIA started to play on her mother's loyalty to democracy. The final step in the recruitment process would be the pitch. And that's when you, you actually ask the person to come over and work for the CIA, U.S. intelligence, and ultimately the U.S. government. And at that point, uh, the handler, the case officer, has got to be absolutely convinced that the vulnerabilities are there. The person has, has accepted uh, the offer for help or, or the offer to, to uh, come over to the U.S. government. And so uh, they would have to have her so convinced, and they would have quite a bit of evidence to do that, so convinced that Castro had absolutely betrayed her, that his sole aim was to invade the United States and overturn the U.S. government. Uh, so there's only one option. She's got to come over and she's got to help. The CIA said to me, uh, now you can work for us and how proud my mother would be and how proud we would be and you could shake hands with the president. We're gonna, you could be really proud, you, know? you could be a hero, you know, you had money for life, you know, you get rid of the shame, you know, get you back in good graces with your father. Marita says her mother's approval was a key factor in changing her mind. My mother was working for the U.S. military in Germany. Through their connections, the CIA had reached out to Marita's mother directly. Alice Lorenz was horrified about her daughter's affair and joined the CIA in convincing her about the evils of communism. It was then Marita also met the two agents that would play the biggest role in her life of espionage. One was Alex Rourke. And that's where I met Alexander I. Rourke, Jr., the priest turned CIA agent. He'd take me to church, and I don't know anything about religion. The second was Frank Sturgis. Frank Sturgis. He was, a, he was an ex-Marine um, military pilot who joined the CIA and was a contract employee or full-time employee, worked out of the American Embassy in Cuba. Um, they were ex-employees, but being paid. They were doing dirty work for, for the CIA. Jim Hunt, Sturgis's nephew, explains that Sturgis and Marita had actually met before her CIA recruitment. I believe that uh, Frank uh, Sturgis first met Marita sometime in May of 1959 in Havana. And he was part of uh, Fidel's inner circle, so he knew who she was. Uh, it, by May of 1959, I think Frank had made up his mind that he was probably going to be leaving Cuba because of the uh, focus of the revolution not going towards communism. Sturgis had originally been part of Castro's government, but was soon disillusioned by it and turned double agent. Hunt says some of the rebels were promised democracy after Castro's takeover and were angry that turned out to be a lie. Well, one of the first things he did was he trained Andy Castro guerrillas in the Miami and out in the Everglades. During his whole life, Frank probably made maybe a hundred or more incursions into Cuba, uh, clandestine incursions, either by boat or by plane. In October of 1959, Frank got into his B-25 airplane with a guy named Pedro de Islans, who had been the head of the Air, Air Force. And the two of them flew over Havana and dropped a bunch of anti castro leaflets all over the place. Yeah, and as a matter of fact, uh, after the, the incident with the leaflets being dropped on Havana, that's what made Fidel break off diplomatic relations with the United States. Uh, some people in the press called him a real-life James Bond, and he certainly was. Uh, he used over 30 different aliases in his career as a spy and, and as, as an assassin. Uh, 
I lived with Frank for a year in, in Miami when I was in college. Uh, he had a whole drawer full of uh, phony IDs. I mean, some of them <laughs> were <laughs> from uh, South American countries. I mean, he, uh, the man uh, was, was clearly, he was a man of action. Uh, he didn't just sit around and talk about his beliefs and uh, didn't like communism. He didn't like the totalitarianism that was associated with, with, the, with communism, that is the control of the total control of the individual's life, and took a stand against those things uh, and basically waged a, a 30-year war against Fidel Castro. With the conviction of Alex Sturgis and her own mother, Marita finally willingly agreed to work with the CIA on espionage against Castro. Later reports said that Marita's initial missions involved gathering intelligence on the pro-Castro movement in New York. But in December, the CIA revealed that they had other plans for her. But we want you to take him out. Look, can you just put this, put something in his food and put him to sleep? And I said, are you trying to tell me to kill him? And they said, well, we don't use those words. It's uh, just kind of neutralizing him. He would, you would never know, and you would leave. I said, I can't kill him. When Frank Sturgis talked to me about various plots to assassinate Fidel Castro, he told me that one of the means was to use a woman, just generically a woman, because Fidel liked women. And, you know, and Marita Lorenz was a woman who could get very close to Fidel uh, because of her relationship with him and having been his lover. And so she was a natural choice for this particular job. Marita was obviously hesitant, but the CIA had to convince her that this is for the good of the innocence of the United States. Castro, they said, could very well start a nuclear war. They would have to have her so convinced that Castro had absolutely betrayed her, that his sole aim was to invade the United States and overturn the U.S. government, that the lives of, of millions of American people people were at stake, that the U.S. Constitution was at stake, and possibly a nuclear uh, war was at stake, and she was one of the only ones that could stop that. This, first they butter you up, then they tell you you're going to be rewarded with medals, money for the rest of your life, and walk in and out of the White House and be one of our favorite, get a star at, at the CIA headquarters, and be a hero and save lives. Just think of it, Rita. You will save this country from the evils of communism. Think of Albania. Think of Russia. Think of what they're going to do to our young people. You will have no more freedom. You know, the soldiers will die on the battlefield because you didn't do that one small little thing. There was another piece of information they revealed, one that she hadn't known. Castro had been getting help from the Soviet Union. And in part, Castro turned to the Soviets because of you know, some of the policies that the United States had. We put the squeeze on Castro. We started with embargoes, cutting down on basics like medicine to the island in retaliation for Castro nationalizing some of the industries. So Castro had nowhere else really to turn at that point except to the Soviets to supply him with, with basic, you know, necessity, basic need, basic aid. The only time I really had that sink in was when I saw the missile site photos of, of the missile sites, the Cuban missile site, the U-2 pilot planes, right? And I saw the Soviet freighters going in with all the hardware warm it and I, I said oh shit they they had something marita really started to believe castro was capable of this but she still wanted to see him again the cia said they would send her back to cuba on the condition that she assassinate castro they said, said you want to go back you want to go back and I, I said yes of course well you can go back but but could you do us a favor? You know, this was to this was told to me in the 69th Street FBI office on the fourth floor with a table that had a button underneath it. And there were two agents. That, and then Alex started with his religious stuff. 
uh, well, God forgives, you know, some people that do jobs like these, and you'd be very important. You could shake hands with the president and save the United States from communism and a possible invasion, blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, maybe they weren't all that wrong. You know, it's, it's, it's really going to happen. He's going to, if they don't watch what they're doing, if he does unpredictable, you can push that button. I would prevent an invasion. If I went ahead and just slipped him something to go to sleep, I would, we, we would not have an invasion force growing in Guatemala. Marita was set to go back to Cuba as a spy, but first, the CIA needed to be sure her six-week absence wouldn't raise any eyebrows. In December of 1959, the CIA conducted a dry run of the mission. Marita was sent back to Cuba briefly to see how Castro would react to seeing her. More importantly, though, it was to see if she still had clearance to get close to him. That I could absolutely get close to him. I had the keys to the suite. Tw with the HH on it, Havana Hilton, 20, room 2408. And I could just walk in and walk out. Marita used the excuse that she had missed her family and had returned temporarily to New York. It seemed to work. So from there, the CIA sent her to Miami, where she met up with Sturgis. Here, they would be on equal footing as CIA operatives. When Marita Lorenz met with Frank Sturgis in, in January of 1960 uh, to proceed with this plot to assassinate Fidel Castro, Frank at that point was working hand-in-hand uh, -hand with the CIA in an attempt to overthrow the Fidel Castro government. Sturgis's job was to come up with a suitable murder weapon. Should it be a gun, a knife? But all of those were too messy, and Marita wasn't yet skilled in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Eventually, Sturgis decided that poison pills would be the best bet. To get hold of the poison, Jim Hunt says Sturgis might have tapped an exo-governmental source. When Frank told me the story, when Frank Sturgis told me the story, I uh, said, poison him? How do you get, where do you come up with poison, Frank? And he looked at me and said, well, uh, I got him from some friends. And I said, friends? He said, let's just say close family of friends. And of course, I knew he was talking about the mafia. The American mafia had just as much a grudge against Castro as the CIA did. The mob had enjoyed gambling outposts in Cuba for 50 years, but when Castro came to power, he kicked them out. And most of the gambling in Havana and Cuba was, was controlled by the American and also the Cuban wing of the, uh, the mafia. The reason that they would do that, obviously, is the mafia could get these poisons uh, illegally, uh, which, which the United States could not do, or even the CIA officers would prefer not to do. Sturgis gave Marita a few pills containing botulism toxin. The toxin would not be traceable to a specific source and was water-soluble. And critically for this scenario, the death would not be unpleasant. They would cause a very, um, uh, a very, very, uh, lack of a better term, uh, easy, easy death in, in terms that some of them would just cause Fidel to fall asleep. So they, they would portray to her that, look, this is a, a very easy way to go. It's, you're, you're not going to be pulling a trigger on a gun. There's no violence uh, in this, and it's a merciful way to do it. The problem was now to figure out when to set this into motion. Castro had no routine, no set pattern. He was in Havana one minute, then across the other side of the island the next. Even his closest associates had little idea where he would be spending the night. He, he had no hours. He had no timing. And nobody could make an appointment with him. He was always six or eight hours late. His clients' watches meant nothing. He would come in, and he would, he would come and go as he pleased and he wished. Eventually, the agents spotted a pattern. Castro gave regular public television broadcasts to tell his people how they were all benefiting from the revolution. Whenever he went to make a live television speech, he would stay at his penthouse in the Havana Hilton. So, just after New Year 1960, Marita was sent back to Cuba. On the way over, Marita was still going over the mission in her head, not sure if she was ready. And I was in the plane, and I was nervous. Don't do it. 
and I could see them all in the background, you know, behind the gates, waving. Ah, ah. You know, she's going to go to kill Fidel, you know. Uh, this was one of the most tense times and was leading into one of the most tense times in U.S. history in, in terms of intelligence and military involvement in the Cold War, uh, in our relationship with Russia and their connection to Cuba. Uh, so this operation would have been of utmost importance to the CIA and to the U.S. government. The trip from Miami to Havana takes about 30 minutes. It was long enough for Marita to panic. She was nervous about carrying a weapon, even pills. What if airport officials found them and questioned her? The pills made me nervous. And I took them out and I went into the bathroom and I put them in the Coke, the cold cream jar. So I put them in the jar and pushed them down. And I felt better. And then I put them back into my little case, travel case. And I, I felt I be okay going through customs. They made it through customs unchecked. It seemed like for now, the trick with cold cream worked. Her mission clear, Marita headed to the Havana Hilton, where she still had the key. At Jose Marti Airport, we landed there, and then uh, in the Hilton, I went back to the Hilton, used my key, walked right in, put my uniform jacket on, to make myself feel real good, and Stuck in the bathroom, closed the door, hoping she don't didn't walk in right now. Because I had the pills in the jar. And I said, don't do it, don't do it. I was talking to myself. And I said, oh my God. And I could see them closing in on me like if I didn't. You know, I was felt, I felt like a turtle wanting to really put its head under the shell and never coming out. No way could I escape. I was trapped here, trapped there. I have this man's life in my hands. Wow. All because of these little tiny pills. I felt important. I almost felt like I was able to grasp that I couldn't get out of and that I was going to be saving American lives if I took this one life. God will forgive me. My heart was crying and Oh God, yeah, I was scared shitless, absolutely scared. And I took the, I opened the jar of cold cream, my hand was shaking. Marita was supposed to put the pills in Castro's drink before he arrived, but the pills were plastered in cold cream. It stuck to the small gelatin pills like glue. And it, it just looked limp, it fell over. And I tried to wipe the cold cream off of it and there was no way I could grasp the ends of it with the sticky cold cream. Because if I did, the insides would get uh, ruined. Maybe my fingers would burn off. I was so scared of what was in them. Marita desperately had to abort the mission. I was panicking. I thought I heard the door and Fidel was coming in and I kept pushing the thing down, pushing the water lever down and, and they, one went down and the other one didn't and I had to get rid of all that and I smelled like Pond's cold cream and Fidel walks in and he said, you're back. But there was a different look in his eye and in his face. He was more suspicious. And I said, yes, I'm back. Castro had finally walked into the room. Faced with the man she loved, Marita lost her nerve. I said, Fidel, I love you, I love you, I'm back. I'm going to stay, this and that, you know. And he said, you're back. What you been up to, hanging around those Miami people? And when he said that, oh my God, he knows. He knows. And he just looked at me and shook his head, puffing on the cigar like, if you've been unfaithful to me, that type of expression, but not unfaithful, hanging around the CIA guys, contra revolucionarios, big bad word, it meant paredon, you can go to the wall for that. She had been gone too long. Castro was suspicious and fairly certain she was working with the CIA. So what was he going to do next? And then he just lifted up his butt, took off the gun belt, and threw it over the lamp. 
They said, they looked at me. Did you come to kill me? And I was just standing over him. I said, yes. Okay. And he took the gun out of the holster. Which, and he said, he, he turned it, flipped it around and he gave it to me. It had a white pearl handle. I said, oh shit, he's going to shoot me. He was for a split second a little nervous. He definitely was. He turned to his side, you know, like, she's got the gun in her hand. What is she going to do? Who is she really? Did they get to her that much yet? And then he just took a puff of smoke on a cigar and closed his eyes. He said, Nobody could kill me. Ninguno. Nunca. Nobody ever could kill me. The confident Castro gave Marita his gun. This was a second chance, but Marita and Castro both knew what she was going to do. I ejected the, the magazine out of the gun, and it clicked. And at that, he jumped a little bit. And he just looked at me, and then I put the gun back in the holster, and then he, he said, come here. He left himself wide open, vulnerable, lying on the bed. Or sh I could have killed him. Marita left the suite and headed back to the airport. She had failed the mission. What the hell do I do now? With them, the CIA downstairs, at the airport. God, I'm a failure. Frank Sturgis felt that Marita lost her nerve on this particular assignment, mainly because of her feelings about Fidel. You know, Fidel was a very charismatic person. Frank himself was mesmerized by Fidel, so I mean, you can imagine, I'm sure Marita was too. And Frank felt that, you know, when she got there, she, you know, the, the old emotions, if you will, took over. And she just wasn't willing to, to you know, take the step to actually to end his life. She wasn't going to do it. Marita's was the first assassination attempt on Castro's life. It was the closest anyone has managed to get to him. Since then, there were an estimated 638 plots to kill Castro, ranging from an all-out invasion to exploding cigars, poison pens, and sniper attacks. All of them failed. Castro died of natural causes in November 2016. He's survived quite a few assassination attempts. Only a few of them were, were directed, sponsored by the American government, many others. The great majority of them, I think, were sponsored by Cuban, Cuban exiles who were just militantly opposed, violently opposed to the Castro government. He created a very powerful and thoroughly ruthless machine for uh, internal security. He created one of the world's best intelligence and counterintelligence organizations. I, I counted among the five or six best intelligence organizations, foreign intelligence agencies in the world. And, uh, and Fidel, Fidel survived because he was absolutely ruthless. He, uh, whenever, whenever he even had a scent or a hint of opposition, whether it was a group of Cubans somewhere on the island or some individual, prominent individual in, his, uh, in the Cuban leadership, even a hint of opposition was enough to, uh, to result in that person's political extermination and possibly even their execution. The year after Frank Sturgis gave Marita the poison pills, he helped plan the CIA-funded Bay of Pigs invasion of Cuba. It was another failed attempt to overthrow the Castro government. He was later arrested as one of the Watergate burglars sent by President Richard Nixon to break into the Democratic National Headquarters. Sturgis was imprisoned for 13 months. Marita continued to work against the Castro government. She received formal espionage and sharpshooting training. During a fundraising mission, she met the former president of Venezuela, Marcos Perez Jimenez. Marita and Perez had a brief affair and a daughter before he was imprisoned on charges of embezzling $200 million. Marita still has her daughter, but she says that years later, she heard some shocking news from the two FBI agents who initially recruited her. First of all, the two agents that told us Oh, late years later, they said, yeah, we know you have a kid with him. Yeah, we know. We saw him. We know who raised him. His name's Andre. Good-looking boy. 
you know, I got other kids. The two CIA agents in Tampa, Florida told me that years later. Marita and her daughter have spent time searching for Andre, but to no avail. There is still a debate as to whether or not he exists. In the next episode, Che Guevara was seen by many as a hero, spreading people-led revolution throughout Latin America. But towards the end of his career, things were getting out of control, and the FBI would send someone to take care of him. Felix Rodriguez hated Guevara, but tried to spare his life. Instead, he ended up being the one who had him killed. I think it was very personal for, um, for Felix. He saw a lot of his friends die. He saw a lot of their businesses confiscated. He saw a lot of good people hurt, and this was his chance to do something good, to bring down someone who he believed was evil. That's next time on Covert. Covert is an Audio Boom and World Media Rights co-production hosted by me, Jamie Rennell. It is produced by Audio Boom's Ben Hosley, Rachel Jacobs, and Karen Bevan, and by Pascal Hughes for World Media Rights. We had additional production help from World Media Rights by Gerald Zabengua. David McNabb is the series creative director, and the executive producers for Audio Boom are Brendan Regan and Stuart Last. If you haven't already, don't forget to follow us on Instagram at Covert Podcast, on Spotify, or subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you find your favorite shows. And hey, if you've got some time, give us a review.